Lord willing, today we're going to try to finish up number 16. This is number 16, part 2. And uh, if you remember from last week, this brought out some, just some phenomenal stuff about what it is that the Lord is doing in the midst of his people. Not just um, from our standpoint, but this has been going on for quite a while. And we can see the beauty in what God is doing when he calls an individual or a, a people to himself. We are now living in the, the day when he's calling individuals and he's grouped them as the church or as the bride of Christ. And, and that's who we are. Now, during this time that we're studying, this is Israel. Um, it is also going to be called, sometimes it's be called, it will be called uh, uh, Judah, Sometimes it will be called uh, Jerusalem, um, basically calling it for the, the uh, name of the uh, top city, which was Jerusalem, the head city. Um, but that call of these people have personal responsibilities. All right? So you could say, I'm part of the church. Well, that's true, but you have personal responsibilities. As a, as a, 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 a person representing that group or that organization. Well, we're going to see here that these people were, were brought out as one group. They were all brought out of Egypt as one group. And everybody came out. They all came out how? Together. One group. But they were not all together. It reminds me a lot of how our nation is today in the United States. We are one nation. And we have, you know, one, one citizenship. But a lot of times we are not always together. And not to say that we all should be thinking and, and feeling alike. But some differences mean more than others. All right? And we're going to try to point that out. All right. Now, just like we did on last week, this week, before we get started, I want to get a little flavor. Because remember, we were talking about what we are seeing here is not just how these people are, but this was something that was given, or I use the word dripped to them. It was, it was kind of laid down from someone else. And we're going to go and take a look at that someone else before we go into our reading. So let's turn quickly to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. I'm sorry, chapter 28, Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, what I would have liked to have done is just go through this entire 28 chapter, but we'll do that when we get to Ezekiel. But what I'm going to do is just highlight a few things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just point out a few little pointers here. So in Ezekiel 28, I'm going to read, I'm going to start at the second verse. What I want you to understand here is that Initially, Ezekiel is talking to a human person, but then he's talking past the person and talking to the, the entity or the power or the spirit that's in the person. And we got to keep that in mind. All right. So he's talking to a human person, but he's also talking to the, the person that is empowering him who we will see who that is in just a minute. So let's take a look. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre. He was talking to the prince or the, the head of Tyre, a nation. And right, so he's talking to this leader. Uh, thou uh, said the, uh, the Lord thy God, uh, I'm sorry, thus said the Lord thy God, because thy heart is lifted up. This man's heart is lifted up. And thou hast said, I am a God. So this man is talking about himself being a God. All right? We see a lot of that stuff going on today. And look what he continues to say. I sit in the seat of God. Okay. In the midst of the sea. Yet thou art a man and not God. Mm-hmm. So God said, I know what's in your heart. You're saying you are a God and you're sitting in the seat of God, but I'm telling you, you're just a man. You are not God. Though thou set thy heart as 
the heart of God. Even though you're setting your heart to act and react and be like God. All right, he's letting them know you're not a God. Let's skip down to, to uh, verse um, 6. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thy heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore will I bring strangers unto thee, the terrible uh, of the nation. All right, so what he's saying here is, because of what you said, I'm going to allow certain things to come into you. That's something we should keep in mind. All right. When you say certain things, you close or open doors. Let's keep going. Uh, uh, for, for, um, Calvin, uh, we're, on, we're just doing a quick little re uh, uh, research in Ezekiel 28, Calvin. So we, we want to turn there to get caught up with it. Ezekiel 28. All right. And so um, or now we're going to go. We're going to skip down. And we're going to go now to what the Lord is saying to not only the man, but the spirit in the man. Let's go down to verse 12. Son of man, take a lamentation unto the king of Tyre. I remember that was the, the prince, right? And say unto him, uh, thus saith the Lord thy God, thou hast sealed up the sum of wisdom. In other words, I made you very wise, right? And perfect in beauty. And I made you very perfect. Now, he's talking to this man. But look at this here. This is how we know he's talking not just to the man, but to the power or the spirit behind the man. Look at verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Uh, the prince of Tyre wasn't in Eden. Who was in Eden? Satan. Satan. All right. So look what he said. He's talking. So now he's talking... To to the man and through the man, right to the devil. This in the man. And the devil is dripping his authority and power into the prince of Tyre. Look what he says here. He says, even precious stones were your covering. The sawdust, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, the jasper, and the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in the day that thou was created. Now, <clears throat> this goes to say a whole lot about this power behind the king of Tyre, Satan. And we can say a lot about this, but let me briefly say, it talks about his construction. All right, let's look at human beings from a, it's a biological standpoint. Basically, we are mainly carbon-based units. So, you know, we look at what we are really made of. The scripture says we were made from the dust of the earth. But you say, okay, well, what kind of dust? Basically, we're carbon. All right? Carbon and water. And and, and then all of that is you, you maneuver those uh, molecules in carbon, and you basically can make all the different components that we are made of. When you maneuver and set those molecules in different order, you break it. You basically can have all the bone and the, and the flesh and all the different things that we are made from. Look at what Satan has. Look at the, the uh, item that he was made from that was in him. And we have lungs and stuff. He had pipes. So you, t you talk about pipes. Is another phrase for that was his, his uh, inner uh, being was made for ultimate praise. We can praise God with our, uh, 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 you know, take breath and, and speak out the praises of God. Uh, but it, it, some people even uh, imagine that maybe within him himself, he had his own personal musical instrument within himself. Uh, he, and that's one of the reasons why he was also called the, uh, the chief praise worship before he fell. All right? But let's keep going. I'm, I don't want to get stuck here because we're talking about this nature that he had, that he dripped to the king of Tyre, okay? to the prince of Tyre. Look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. So if you had any doubt about him being in Egypt, maybe that really wasn't Satan. Well, right here in verse 14, that removes that doubt because it tells me I'm talking to that cherub, that, that angel, that angelic being. And he says, you were an anointed cherub. Amen. Uh, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. 
and I have set thee so. In other words, God said, I made you like that. I made you that beautiful and that wise and, and, and all of that. That was upon the holy mountain of God. I let you come up into my very presence. We're going to get back to that when we get back to the children of Israel here. You're on the mountain of God. Thou hast walked um, up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. All right. So, in other words, when you're walking on the stones of fire, the stones of fire are there to destroy everything that is not like God. In other words, that's how come God is holy, uh, uh, thrice holy. All right, he's holy, holy, holy. All right, look at 15. Thou was perfect in all thy ways. That's why he could walk upon the stones of fire at that time, because he was what? Perfect in all his ways. Uh, in all thy ways, from the day thou was created, and here's the, here's the enter, till iniquity was found in thee. See, once you have iniquity find it, found in you, when you start walking on that holy fire, guess what you're going to do? You're going to be going, ouch. <laughs> All right? Let's, let's, let's skip down. I can say a whole lot about that. Let's go down to verse 18. This is the last verse we're going to look at. And then we're going to go back to Numbers. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuary. In other words, he said, you've defiled what God has given to you. The place, the sanctuary where God meets us is, is what Satan had. He had a sanctuary where God's presence dwelt in him, and he defiled it. By the multitudes of thine iniquities, by the iniquities of thy traffic. In other words, he wasn't just doing it to himself. He was trying to influence others. All right? You, th you think about, you know, drug traffic. The ultimate trafficker ever is Satan because he's selling real bad goods. He's selling the worst drug there is. He's selling anti-God drugs. He's the worst... A, a, a pusher you will ever see and he's still pushing to this day therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee so what he's going to bring the fire that he once was able to walk on he's going to God's going to put that fire in him and what is what's going to happen and it shall devour thee and I will bring thee to ashes now what's ashes Ashes is when all the component, all the molecular uh, aspects that can be uh, uh, <coughs> developed are brought down to its lowest common denominator. All right? Ashes. That's what fire does. It breaks it down to, to its lowest common denominator. Upon the earth, in the sight of all them that behold thee. In other words, everyone's going to see the final outcome of the great trafficker, the great pusher, the one that's dripping all this iniquity into people's hearts and minds and lives, Satan, people will see his ultimate destruction. All right. Now, doing this as a backdrop, so when we get back to our study today, we can see this continuous drip of Satan into the hearts and minds of these people now that came out of Egypt and are now in the very presence of God, but they ain't all God's people. All right. And so let's take a look at, uh, let's take a listen now to our study. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 16. Let's take a listen. Chapter 16. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Eleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will shew who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do. Take you senses, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And 
Moses said unto Korah, Hear, I pray you, ye sons of Levi. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel, to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth, and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer, and put fire in them and laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, Shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die, the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord, and consumed the two hundred and fifty men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. The censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar. For they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers, wherewith they that were burnt had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that 
no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah, and as his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. <laughs> and it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense, and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were fourteen thousand and seven hundred, beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. All right. So, as you can see here, this is, once again, uh, an outstanding portion of Scripture in the sense that it tells us and teaches us so much. Now, what I'm not going to do, normally what I usually try to do is to go back and kind of do a little quick rehearsal. I'm going to do a very, very little bit of that, only to kind of focus on what we are looking at uh, here. All right, so let's take a look. Um, I want to identify a couple of things here. We want to identify the uh, participants in this situation. This chapter opens up and it says now Korah. All right, so we understand Korah and we saw last week what happened to Korah. And then it talks about Dathan and Abiram. Okay, and it says and they arose. Okay, but now I also want to go down. I'm just going to read real quick uh, verse 2. And it says, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 200 and 50 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation and men of renown. So we got to keep in mind those 250 people that walked with them. Now, remember when we read Ezekiel and we talked about how Satan was a trafficker. He's not trying to go by himself. Dathan and Abiram uh, and, uh, uh, and Korah were able to sell their bad goods to 250 other popular people. Okay? And so we saw what happened to them. Now, I want to I also bring up and point out, in verse 21, God told Moses, he said, separate yourself from among the congregation. So now that's a fourth, uh, uh, that's, that's another uh, um, uh, set of people. So we had Korah, then we had Dathan and Abiram, then we had the 250 people, and the congregation, the, the whole people. All right? But look, and, and it says, and I will consume them in a moment. So God's initial response was what he uh, allows to happen to sin. Sin cannot be in his presence. But Amen. what we see is, and it's, in 22, it says, and they, speaking of Moses and Aaron, fell upon their faces and said, O God, uh, the God of the spirit of all flesh, will one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with the whole congregation? So what we saw here was that Moses became a type of Christ. Okay? So God said, I'm, a, I'm going to destroy everything that has sin." And because Moses is a type of Christ, remember, Moses said that there's going to be another one that's going to come, another prophet that's going to come like me. Hear him. But Moses did, and God allowed this to actually paint the picture that Moses became the hedge between what is supposed to happen between God and sin. The moment iniquity was found in Satan's uh, 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 heart or being, he was removed from the presence of God. Well, what we have here is another situation, and God didn't remove the congregation. He didn't kill it, 
Moses and Aaron stood there as a what? As a hedge in between. And I can't emphasize the importance of that. That's why I'm kind of going back to that particular part to talk about that hedge. It's always there. It's around you now. And it's always there because once the hedge is removed, then the enemy, Satan, will come in. And the fact that you are not totally destroyed, you're not totally crazy, you're not, and you're not dead, is because the hedge is there. What did God say to, to, to Satan about Job? He, he removed the hedge, but he kept the hedge on his body first. And he said, you can't touch his body. And Satan couldn't touch it, but he touched everything around him. Then God said, I'll even remove the hedge from around his body, and you can get to his body. Satan got right to his body, but God kept another hedge up, and that hedge was what? You can't kill him. And then eventually what happened? God built the hedges back up and gave Job all back his stuff. Now, I'm bringing that out because I want you to understand that when we see death happen and we see bad things happen, it's only from a standpoint of that's what's supposed to happen. That's the world we live in. We live in a world of sin and death. So the only reason that that goodness and, and purity and kindness happens is because God puts a hedge and keeps the enemy from infiltrating and tricking us. Remember, he was wiser than all uh, uh, of all those that he had created. So uh, without the protection or the hedging of God, we all would fall into that. But our love and our seek of God protects us. We don't fight our own battles. God's fight now. Now, I wanted to make sure we understood that. Now, let's get back to where we left off on last week. We finished last week on verse 33. And I'm just going to read that because that was the last one we did. And it says, they and all uh, the, uh, the, they appeared unto them, went down alive. So they, and, and remember, this is the, the earth opened up and everything that was with Korah and Dathan and Abiram, the earth opened up and swallowed them and all their families. So look at what 33 says. They and all that uh, uh, Pertain. uh, attain, pertaineth unto them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. So who's left? Just the congregation. Keep that in mind. Let's keep reading. Verse 34. And all Israel that were around about them fled. So now the congregation, the remaining people, they begin running. And that's what happens. When the Lord comes in and he sets judgment, they run. and Because they're getting out of what? I want to move out of the way of danger. But where are you going to run to? Where are you going to run to? Where are you going to run? Who, who, where are you going? It's just a lot of action, a lot of, a lot of activity for no particular purpose. You're not gaining or getting anything. All right? And they fled uh, at the cry of them, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. Well, keep this in mind. If God wanted the congregation to get swallowed up, guess what would have happened? They would have got swallowed up. So you running over, all you need to do is set your heart to, towards God. When we see all this craziness going on in our world today, and we were like, well, I want to run. I want to get out of America. I want to get out of here. I want to Look, all you got to do is go to God. If you're going to run, run to God. That's where you're going to find some safety. Okay? But they all fled and they cried. Let's keep going. Verse 35, number 16, verse 35. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consume the 250 men that, that uh, offered incense. Remember, we already dealt, we already saw what happened with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and their families. What happened? The earth opened up, swallowed them up alive, and they went down, the scripture says, into the pit. But remember, they had 250 men that they had convinced they, they sold their bad goods to them. So now, look what happens to them. So, Dathan and Byram and Korah, the earth opened up. Look at 35. 
and there came out fire from the Lord. So fire came now upon these guys and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Now, remember, these were individuals that said, we can go and we can get incense and we can be God representatives just like Moses and Aaron is. So in other words, what are they trying to be? I'm going to be just like God's people. I'm going to be, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it, but I'm going to call myself a man of God. I'm going to call myself a, 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 a leader uh, in the presence of God. But you were not called to that. That wasn't your position. Only Moses and Aaron were supposed to do it. And then from the standpoint of carrying the incense, it was only supposed to be those that were what? Born from the line of Aaron. And we talked about that being a very important type of the aspect of you cannot become part of this priesthood unless you're born in it. Just like you can't become a, a priest of God, a child of God, unless you're what? Born again. Jesus said that. He said, marvel not. I say unto you, you must, not should, not I think, you must be born again. So you got to take on a whole new nature. Otherwise, you're going to be part of this bad congregation. Let's keep going, though. We're going to see this again. I'll, I'll reiterate what I just said in a minute. I got a little ahead of myself. 36. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest. Okay? Now, he's saying, you go to, you go to Eliezer. Why are we going to deal with him? Because he was born to do what he's about to do. That he take the censers out of the burning uh, and scatter thou and scattered fire yonder, for they are hallowed. So now what God told the true born priest, the person that was born to do this. Now all those individuals they got seared and burnt up, burnt to ash in the fire. Their senses that they were carrying are still there. The senses are things that I've ordained. I've ordained the senses with the incense to be used. They're not destroyed. You go get that. So when you got lying people carrying the truth of God, guess what you got? You got inconsistency. You got something that's not going to work right. You can't have devilish people carrying the word of God. Amen. Because you're still going to be a devil. Even though you got the word, I got the word of God with me. Yeah, but your heart is still devilish. The word of God will not protect you if you got a devilish heart. You can have the Bible all up and down. You memorize it, know it, quote it. You got, I, I got the word of God all over me. Yeah, but you're not born again. So that fire came, consumed them, but the senses were still there. And so what God told Eliezer Go pick up all those senses, and we're going to do something with them. Look what he says. The senses of these, of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them uh, board plates for the covering of the altar. So he said, you're going to take those senses, and we're going to, we're going to change them from senses, and we're going to bring them in, and melt them down and put them over the altar. Why? Let's take a, let's keep reading. For they offered them before the Lord, therefore they will that they are hollow, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. All right, so he took it, he's gonna take these and make them a image or a sign or a memorial to remember when devilish people try to proclaim themselves as God using the things of God. They're going to all end up like Satan. Satan was what? When we saw, he's going to be turned into ash. That's what we saw in Ezekiel 28, right? And what happened to these individuals? They were turned to ash. When you drip from the things of Satan, you're going to get what Satan's going to get. Now, Satan's uh, uh, ash turning is still futuristic. This happened to them now. But the thing we can keep in mind is if God said it, it's as good as already happened. It's not going to change. Amen. All right. Let's go, so let's look and see what, what happened here. 39. And Eliezer, the priest. I like that. It said Eliezer, 
the priest. How do you become a priest? You got to be born in it. You got to be born from the line of Aaron. The only priest that is a true priest that was not born in the line of Aaron is who? Jesus. Jesus. He was born from the from the uh, the the the, uh, the makeup of uh, Melchizedek, whom whom uh, uh, Abraham offered up an offering and gave offerings to as being his priest. All right, so let's keep going. And Eliezer the priest took the brazen censers wherewith they that were burnt had of offering, and they were made board plates for the covering of the, or, of, of the altar to be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger okay, keep that in mind which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord that he be not as Korah and as his company as the Lord said unto him by the hand of Moses. So, what is he doing? I'm going to make a memorial. If you're going to try to act like you can be God, Korah wanted to be head. Those other individuals said, we can carry these incense just like uh, anybody else. And we're going to follow Korah. Well, if you follow Korah, you got what Korah got. But who are they ultimately following? Say, if the devil gets in you, he can deceive you. That's why you have to make sure that you're praying and you're seeking that God give you insight and that you offer your heart, mind, and soul to him. You have to be born again. That's your protection. Mm -hmm. If you reject God, if you, don't, if you don't give your heart to God, you are out there for any kind of trickery that may come along. The, the devil is out there on every corner peddling his drugs. He is the ultimate trafficker. And he's got all kinds of drugs. He's got drugs of power. He's got drugs of, of, of authority. Lust. He's got God, drugs of lust. He's got drugs of greed. He's got drugs of all kinds of things. And if you take these drugs, you're going to get hooked. And God help anyone that is indulging in that. Only God can deliver you. Only God. All right, let's keep going. 41. But on the morrow, all the congregation. Now, see, we, we saw Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We saw the 250 people that carried the censer. We still got the congregation left. Let's see how they, how they act. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of God. All right. This takes this 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 needs a pause. We gotta stop it for a minute. Yes. All right. <clears throat> What's going on in the minds of these people? How can this happen? Because see, we we reading this now, and we we would say, Man, these people are not paying attention. <laughs> Something's wrong here. But put ourselves in that situation. Can we be tricked like that? If you think that certain people are people of God and you see things happen to them, you might get mad at God. Suppose, you know, one of your favorite TV evangelists, all of a sudden they get caught up in something. God, why did you allow this to happen to this individual? Well, you got to stop and take, and, and take one thing into account. Nobody is perfect. Amen. Nobody. If you find iniquity in anybody, do not be surprised. Now, how do I know that? The scripture shows us that. It shows us uh, situations in the lives of all his people. Abraham, Noah, David, all of them had issues where Satan got to them in an instant to get them to do something that was way off base. But God says that no man can pluck you out of my hand. If, you're, if you are God's, you may get tricked and, and, and fall into all kinds of situations, 
But if you're God, God will bring you through. And he'll use that situation to make you even better. Moses, uh, 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 Moses was a man that had a, a, a massive temper at one point. And he committed murder. Noah got drunk and had all kinds of illicit stuff going on while he was drunk between his wives and sons and all kinds of stuff. We won't even get into all that. And then um, David, you know, lusted after Bathsheba and then lying and then committed murder. All of that happened. But the thing you have to keep in mind is that you have to see God as God. When you see going, when you see bad things going on and, and people understand they're just people. And that's all we got to keep in mind. I'm not going to lift people to the status of godhood. Because that's what Satan wants. He wants you to worship him. So, when we read this 41st first, first verse, I want to just look at this. It said, But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. See, the problem is what they should have said, Lord, what should we do? But they're attacking Moses because they're seeing Moses as the pusher and the, and the orchestrator of this action. They should see God telling Moses. Then they see the people of God, that they believe what people of God, that died, and instead of them dealing once again with God, they're saying, we weren't wrong. I know that, I know that was God's man. I know those were God's people. And, and Moses did this to them. So what are they doing? Acting They're like taking God. God out the equation. Mm -hmm. They're removing God. It's Moses and these people. Korah, feel, Dathan, the Byram, and the 250. You want to say something, babe? Because they feel that they are gods. They feel I can do this as well. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. They yes. think they know the mind, mind of God. And so what you're doing now is, and, and that's, the, that's actually that's the real thing I want to uh, point out, what you just said. They're taking on the mind and the judgment of God. Instead of them saying, God, give me understanding. That's why you got to have faith. Because God will do things that we, reading this, we get, I get it. I, don't, I see what happened. I can see, you know, from this standpoint, why God did what he did. But from that standpoint, they couldn't see it. When you can't see something, don't get mad at God. Give God the authority to be God. Say, well, then, Lord. Help my I need you to help my understanding. Mm -hmm. Help me. I'm, but I'm going to trust you how? By faith. And that's something that people in our world will not do because they already believe, I know what is the right action. All right? I know what we should do. Uh, if we have some time, <laughs> I might go back to another portion of Scripture <laughs> to kind of emphasize that whole concept of I know what's right better than God. But let's keep going and see if we can get to it. If not, then we'll pick it up another time. All right, verse 42. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, all the individuals now, they're against Moses and against Aaron, God's people, they took, uh, uh, that they looked towards the tabernacle and the con of the congregation, and behold, the, the cloud covereth, uh, covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. The minute they started acting like they understand what God is and who's God and who's God's people and who's not God's people, guess what? God showed himself. No. The, the glory of God showed, so they recognized, you can say what you want about what God's people hear and what God people did and who's God's folks and who's... And when God showed himself, guess what happened? Let's take a look. You ain't got to guess, we can read it. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord said unto Moses, look what he's saying here. Get you up from among the congregation. I want you to separate yourself from among the congregation. That I might consume them in a moment. Now, we saw this already in verse 21. This is the second time that Moses had to stand between God's people. Moses had to do it what? Twice. And you say, man, why did God do that twice? It's all painting the picture. It shows us that the one that's coming like Moses is going to do what Moses did. Moses had to stand before the people how? Two times. 
Guess what God's going to, guess what Jesus is going to do? He's going to stand in our midst how many times? Twice. He had his first coming. He had to stand between us and the congregation. And now he's going to have that second coming. When, when the wrath of God comes, both times when Jesus came, it was to deal with the wrath of God. All right. So he came the first time to give us a means to separate ourselves from the judgment. And then all those that were held captive in the eternal after were led. He said he led captivity captive and brought them all, set them all free. He set the, he set the captives free. All right. And so that was the first time, just like Moses did it the first time. But then after that, then he, they had to deal with Dathan and the Byron. Now, and, and the 250, now the congregation, the rest of the world, the rest of the people, all right? And Moses and Aaron again. Now, who are these? The true priests, the true gods, the, I mean, the true uh, uh, people of God, the chosen folks of God, standing be before the congregation. Look what they say. So, I'm going to read 45 again. Get ye up from among this congregation that I might consume them uh, as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. Who fell upon their faces? Moses and Aaron. Look at 46. And Moses said un, uh, unto Aaron, take a census. So what now was happening? The law is telling the priest, I need you to go do your job. What's beautiful about this is that Moses is representing the law. Who fulfilled the law? Jesus. Jesus. Aaron is representing the priest. Who was our ultimate high priest? Jesus. Jesus. It's showing the work of Jesus in tight form. You know? So it, he said, take a censer. That thing that is the pure aspect of, of true uh, worship of God, that censer with the incense. And put fire there, therein from off the altar and put incense in it. So now Aaron is going to do what those 250 people thought they were going to do to, to, to bring forth the authority and the will of God. And they ended up just, just getting burnt up. Now here's Aaron telling, I mean Moses telling Aaron, you go get that censer. And you know what? Aaron could have said, now wait a minute, Moses. The last people that went and grabbed that censer and got that fire, they got burnt up themselves. But Aaron didn't say that. Why? Because Aaron knew who he was. I can handle the censer because that's what I was born to do. I can handle the fire because that's what I was born to do. I can handle the incense because that's what I was born to do. All right? And he says, and go quickly. <laughs> Behold, I come quickly, right? Go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement. Who atones for us? Jesus. Jesus. For, make an atonement for them, for there is wrath uh, going out from the Lord. The plague is begun. Wow. See, we have to keep in mind that we are living in a planet of plague. The plague is here. And if we don't get behind the, the, the uh, hedge of God, the work of Jesus, the plague will affect us. Let's keep reading. 47. And Aaron <clears throat> took as Moses commanded and ran uh, uh, unto the midst of the congregation. Aaron had to do what? Come in the midst of the congregation. Jesus had to come in the midst of humanity. You see the beauty in this? Right? He had to come into the congregation just like Jesus had to come into uh, the world and be with us. And behold, the plague was begun among the people and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. 48. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. You see that? Moses told Aaron, you go get this and you do this. The law, which, which Aaron went out and did what the law said. So Aaron fulfilled what Moses said. Just like the law is what God gave and Jesus fulfilled the law. And when Jesus fulfilled it, he's able to come and stand between the dead and the living. 
There are some people that are living that are actually dead. And there's some people that are dead that are still living. All right? And so we have to keep that in mind. Look at, 40, look at 49. Now, they that died in the plague were 14,700 besides they that died in the matter of Korah. So look at this. 14,700. It's an amazing situation here. All because of what? What Korah started. What, a, what Korah, uh, Dathan, and Abiram got involved with. And then got 250 of the chief people involved. And then eventually, 14,700 people. Why? Because the wrath of God is no joke. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. No, so, so, by being the 14,700, 14, that was the 250, that was all their generation. Well, no, these were, these were all the people that were all, uh, you know, one congregation, one people. Out of that right. one congregation, there was in the midst Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and those 250. They all died. Remember, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, how did they die? They died because the earth opened up, swallowed them, their wives, and their children, and everything that pertained to them. And they went down, the scripture says, alive into the pit. The 250 were went and got their sensor, and they were burnt up, okay? Because when you play with fire and you're not insulated from the fire, the fire will burn you. You don't play with the things of God. And then now, and then after that, the congregation uh, got a murmuring against uh, Moses and Aaron, and then 14,000 of them died before the, so this all is just, you know, one people all happening within a, you know, a short period of time, a few hours, a few days, however you you know want to deal with the time stand standpoint. But look at the death because of one individual. And that's the point I'm trying to point out. Look at what's going to happen. Look at all the death that happened on planet Earth because of one cherub. One fallen angel. Okay. But now, and, and we're going to, I want to, actually, I think I got enough time. I want to go to the other verse. Let me read 50 here. <clears throat> And Aaron returned unto Moses. Uh, did you, did you, you see that? What happened to the priest? He returned. What did, what, Jesus came to earth, and then what happened? He returned. He returned. So you see all these little gems hidden in here that if you kind of look at it, you can read past it, but I think it's important to kind of look at it and go, oh, wow, there's, there's some more you know, nice uh, coincidences that I don't believe are coincidences. I think it is the, the, the beauty of the word of God. And Aaron returned unto Moses, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Why did Aaron return? Because he was able to stop the plague. Why did Jesus return? Because he was able to stop the, the, the uh, power of death. O oh, death, where is thy... Uh, o oh, grave, where is thy, thy sting? O oh, death, where is thy... How am I saying it? O oh, death, where is thy, thy victory? O oh, grave, where is thy sting? Thank you. I'm quoting it wrong. Why? Because now, since Jesus did what he did, you don't have to die eternally. You don't have to. And you don't have to die and be held captive in paradise. You can die, as Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. All right. You got that one right. I did get that one correct, right? <laughs> All right, I want to look at I want to look at one other thing here. Since we got a, a couple of minutes, um, rather than me just giving you your time back, I want to turn to something here. <clears throat> uh, Isaiah chapter three, and we're going to look at this from a standpoint of once again a city. All right, um, Isaiah chapter three. Um, and we're looking at the city of Jerusalem, just like uh, this 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 uh, congregation that is with Moses. There was a congregation around 
uh, this city. Um, and let me just start, let me see. Let's start at verse 7. So this is Isaiah chapter 3, verse 7. It says, In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler for the people. Look at verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen. Now, once again, God's folks. This is God's city, and, and Jerusalem is that part of Israel that when Israel divides, Judah is going to be that part that still sticks with God. That's why they, uh, uh, Jesus is, is considered the lion of the tribe of Judah. All right, but let's keep going. But look, Jerusalem, God's city, is in ruin. And Judah is fallen. See, the devil has a lot. He, he, he's a busy guy. But let's keep going. Because their tongue and, and their doings are against the Lord. Why did Jerusalem and Judah fall? Because their mouth and their action are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. So that means that everything that God sees doesn't match his glory. Let's look at verse 9. They show their uh, countenance uh, doeth witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Amen. You see that? So, that's exactly what happened with that congregation. They saw God's power. They saw what God did with Dathan and Abiram uh, and, and Korah. They saw what God did with those 250 other rulers. And yet they're still going to not go to God. They're still going to look for opportunity that I can be my own God. And then we fast forward. We're all the way through past David. We're in the time of Isaiah now. And we see that when God establishes the city, he establishes the nation. That's still going to happen. Why is that still happening? It's the same drip. It's the same thing that dripped from Satan that we saw in uh, Ezekiel 14 last week. I'm sorry, in Isaiah 14 last week and Ezekiel 28 this week. It's the same drip. Why? I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't want to hear anything about what I can't do. I'm going to be my own God. Well, why are you going to be your own God? Because I'm setting my own rules. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and I'm going to tell you what's good and what's bad. I'm going to tell you what's wrong or what's right. Nobody's going to tell me. Well, now you're setting yourself up as God. When you have no heaven, no, no hell, you have no earth, you don't even have a, a, a planet or anything to sustain yourself. That should be evidence that you are not a God. God is the self-sustainer. God needs nothing to be him. But we continue to say, I'm going to be my own God. Well, the only way you could be that is if you can separate yourself from everything that there is and still be you. And you can't do that. You can't take out nothing that was given to you by God. You can't take out your lungs. You can't take out your heart. You can't take out anything and still be you. But now, I'm going to close with this. Don't think that people aren't trying to do this. There are people that are trying to find a way <clears throat> to take our minds and upload them into some kind of computer or into some kind of uh, uh, um, uh, outside entity. And you go, wow, that ain't going to happen. Well, I could go uh, to Revelation where we will see that the Antichrist will build a machine. He will build a, 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 a statue or something of himself, and he will give that, uh, that machine the ability to speak and to talk and the ability to even cast out and uh, 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 judgment 
upon people that don't believe and accept the Antichrist. So when you see this, it's all about, I don't want to have anything that God says that I should be, and for him to control it, I'm going to create my own being. And that's what they're going to try to do. Sadly. Why? Because I'm not satisfied being with God. That's the ultimate thing, and that's what we're going to close with. If you're not happy just knowing God and knowing him in the, in the forgiveness of your sin and being in his presence, I don't want to be God. I just want to be with God. See, that should be our ultimate joy. I want to be with God. You know, I want to, if I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm okay. Why? Because thou art with me. As long as God's with me. If I go through difficulty or problem, it's not what God can do. Although he, he shows us from time to time what he can do, just to let us know he is the God of all creation. Amen. So if, if things die, he can resurrect it. If things are broken, he can fix it. If things are out of order, he can put it in order. God can do all of that. But are we going to serve him because he can do that? Or are we going to serve him because he's God? And that's the ultimate question. So what happens? A lot of times, God allows this world to bring forth things. Jesus healed the people that were dead. But what happened to them? They had to do what? They had to die. Jesus healed the man with the palsy. Right? But what happened? The man had to first have the what? The palsy. He healed the blind, but the person had to be what? Blind. So what the Lord is saying, he's using, he's saying, I can take what this world produces, and this world produces brokenness, and I can fix it. And I hope that when you see that, you will recognize that I'm doing something that can't be done by anybody other than the creator of all reality. And when Jesus healed the man that was born blind, you know, they said, nobody has ever seen anybody fix anyone that was ever born blind. All right? And yet, we're going to watch as time moves along, we may see, once again, resemblance of this conversation happening in our world. And it's going to seem all, all good and well. Oh, look, you know, we can now do this as humans. And we can now do that as, as, as a, you know, our technology has taken us this far. Pay attention to it. Watch it. Beware. But don't be scared. Because God's got you. He's going to bring you through it. Uh, but we will see things, I'm sure, if, if the Lord allows us to continue to live here on this planet, we're going to see things get more and more closer to what we just read here. And people will act just like that. I don't need God. I got my own fix. I can fix myself. I don't need God's help. I can, I can correct all my problems. If I got an ailment or any kind of issue going on in my body, I don't need to pray to God. I fix it myself. I got my own sensor. I got my own power. I got my own strength. Watch out for that. Now, you say, well, Wayne, are you against people producing things that can help and heal? No, that's not what I'm saying. I, I'm all for that. And I think it's a thing to be celebrated when we can do it. But we should do it with the thankfulness of what God has given. If we acknowledge, look at what the, the wisdom of God has given us. If we allow God to trickle down in us and say, I can do this by the power of God and give God the glory, then we're going to be fine. But if we do it and go, I can do it and don't need God, that's the problem. So it's all about how we're going to see it. All right. And so that's what we want to keep in mind. Lord willing, uh, uh, you know, we will be able, be able to stand on the proper side of that. All right. I'm going to stop because I can keep talking about that forever. Uh, any other comments or questions on what we talked about today?